یکی از دستاوردهای مهم اسرائیل در حوزه مدیریت منابع آب شیرین کردن آب شور دریا بوده به عبارتی نمک زدایی رو تونست انجام بده و این فناوری رو گسترش بده و حتی ایران هم در دعه های چهل و پنجاه شمسی این روش رو در جاهای مختلف انجام داد که از اسرائیلی ها آموخته بود با این حال دیده ایم که مثلا در عربستان سعودی در محدوده خلیج فارس به خاطر نمک زدایی شاید افزایش میزان شوری بخشای از خلیج فارس هستیم که آسیبی به اکوسیستم اونجا میزنه به نظر شما راه حل و چاره برای رفع چنین مشکلی چی هست با توجه به تجربیاتی که اسرائیلی ها داشتن و مطالعاتی که خود شما انجام دادید you know, it's, uh, it's, there are a number of environmental concerns around uh, desalination of course it's the life of the marine animals and the fish eggs that are sucked in to the desalination process Israel has been thinking about this for 15 or 20 years they've developed some good systems about that Another great concern about, uh, about desalinated water is the high energy load that it causes. Um, Saudi Arabia, as you mentioned, is a very large desalinating uh, water country. They burn about, a mil- reportedly, about a million and a, half ba- million and a half barrels of oil a day so that they can desalinate the water for their country. That's a large environmental cost. Israel's been worrying about the, because they were until very recently they had no uh, no no energy supplies, so they've been thinking about this as well. And they have two solutions. That, uh, one of which is now deployed at the largest desalination plant they have in the country, which is very low carbon using. And also, there's no reason why in very sunny places like exactly. like Saudi Arabia, like Iran, like Israel, why you couldn't have large photovoltaic fields. so that the energy used is not carbon-based energy, but is renewable energy. As the salinity, it's an engineering problem, but not an engineering crisis. It's, not, it's something that is surmountable and not insurmountable. It's a question of building your, your return pipeline far enough out to the sea so that the brine will be taken and flushed into the large pool of water that is out there. So that if you, if, you, if you don't use a diffuser, then the salt is going to sort of rest in one place. But if you bring it out far enough, you bring it out to where there's wave action, and you put a diffuser in so that the wave motion will diff- help you to diffuse the salt, you really don't have the same kind of salinity problem. If I may say, and I, I'm, I, I, again, I have no antagonism towards the Saudis. In fact, there's much to admire about them, I must say. Um, the, The Saudis um, made some choices with desalination early. They built very energy inefficient. I think it's not such a bad idea for now that the salt, the brine, is deposited back into the waterway. But I would argue for places that have fragile ecosystems that they should be taking long pipelines and bringing the uh, brine back out, diffusing it, and letting the waves bring it into the larger body of water, whether it's the Atlantic Ocean, the Indian Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, or what have you. جمهوری اسلامی طبیعتا با اسرائیل در مورد مسئله هسته ای نگاه متفاوت داره یکی از مسائلی که اخیرا بحث شده این هست که برای نمک زدایی از آب خلیج فارس و یا دریای عمان برای استفاده مردم ایران بیان و ترهای مختلف نمک زدایی رو ایجاد بکنن که البته انرژیشون قاعدتا بایستی بر اساس نظر مدیران ارشد جمهوری اسلامی از انرژی هسته تامین بشه خب این میتونه بهانه برای توسعه برنامه هسته جمهوری اسلامی باشه شما در مقاله‌ای که در نیویورک تایمز نوشتید به این مسئله اشاره میکنید که بحث هسته ای میتونه به نحوی جایگزینی براش وجود داشته باشه برای در حقیقت تولید انرژی برای نمک زدایی میتونید در این باره توضیح بیشتری بدید You know, I, I, I can get into the nuclear issue in a moment, but I also want to say that there's something that you're not mentioning in your, in your question, and that is that geologically speaking, much of Iran is, um, is earthquake-prone territory. And when you have uh, the possibility of seismic action, or earthquake action, large or small, the problem is what do you do with the spent nuclear fuel People don't think this through. 
you need to have a place after your fuel that you've used for your desalination, your electric power, or whatever. I'm pretending for a moment that the leaders of Iran, the Revolutionary Guards, and the, and the administrations of, of government are all legitimate in like Canada or Belgium or Spain. Let's just imagine that for one moment, okay, before we get to the reality of, of, of why they should not be permitted to do what you're talking about. But, but the problem is, is that once they have done this, what are they going to do? Where, will they, where would they be the offtake for the spent fuels? They have to make sure that there's, there's a repository for that. Now, maybe Russia would agree to do that. I don't know. But until we know where the spent fuel is going to go, I would personally, if I'm an Iranian, I would be terrified by this. Imagine the government's plan is to do what? To, to dig a, a deep well, to put a cement cover on it, and then to place all the spent nuclear fuel. Well, that's a great idea until you know when? Until the first major earthquake. Or even minor earthquake that cracks the cement. And then what happens is the nuclear fuel will leach into the soil, will completely contaminate the water, not for a year or five years, but for, for everyone's Currently. lifetime. Uh, you know, and, and, and so, so it's a terrible idea. Now, add to that, the fact that you have a highly volatile and highly irresponsible governance there, and I would personally make the argument that the world should be very careful about giving the rights to Iran to, uh, to build nuclear power plants. Before they do that, if I may suggest, there's a lot of sunshine there. Let them use their billions of dollars and that have been recently received and let them build out photovoltaic fields to power all of this with with clean, renewable energy. I think the world would be a lot happier with that scenario than with some backdoor way towards building out a nuclear capacity. وقتی کتاب شما رو از ابتدا تا انتها مطالعه می‌کردم و بعد شروع کردم لغات کلیدی رو بررسی کردن دیدم که درباره آب مجازی به مسئله اشاره نشده و این سوال برای من پیش آمد که آیا در اسرائیل به مسئله آب مجازی توجه شده یا نه و خودتون آیا بنا دارید در این باره اگه مثلا در جلد دیگری و یا در نسخه دیگری به این مسئله هم بپردازید؟ Yeah, so I'm addressing it in a variety of ways. First of all, I'm working on another water book right now. It doesn't take place in the Middle East. It takes place very much in America. And the reason I'm doing it for America is not only because I'm an American and I care about my homeland, but also because I want to make a point to the world that if in the world's richest society, some very, very terrible management flaws have crept into the way we handle our water uh, and, and water and water purification, that all the more so for the rest of the world, this could be a very great problem. And I really want this to be a wake-up call for America. Not everything is perfect here in my own home uh, as well. Um, I also have another project, uh, but I have to finish this book first, uh, but I have another project involved that, that deals with the economics and national security implications of water. That, you know, this, I'm planning this as if God is kind to me and gives me long life and, and strength, um, there's a lot of things to say about water. So the book about economics and national security would be very much addressing uh, the topic of virtual water. It's something that's on my mind already. I've been thinking about it, but you know, you can only be in one place at a time. And you know, when you're busy running around speaking or speaking to government officials or trying to create policy, it's very hard to also find the time to sit down and write the book, which I'm very annoyed with myself about. I want to be at the, at the keyboard typing away to get th these books out. The issue of virtual water, to go to your question, is a significant one. But here also, um, it's, a, it's a matter of smart governance and smart planning. You know, what, wh where exactly is it that water should be used? Should it be used for agriculture? Should it be used for industry? But the reality is that no matter what you're doing, water plays a role in it. So therefore, you have to be thinking about how you want to deploy your water and utilize your water. Well, one of the problems that we want to مصرف کنندگان رو مطلع بکنیم که برفرض وقتی مثلا دارن یک غذایی میخورن مثل استیک میزان آبی که صرف شده تا گوشت گاو تهیه بشه مثلا به ازای هر کیلو چیزی حدود 15900 لیتر هست و این خب رقم بسیار زیادی است you know, you know I, I, I don't say audience, and that is that if you want to understand the effect of diet on our water supply, just consider this one fact. 
if you want to grow a pound of beef, which is the diet of more affluent people, and we want people to be affluent, affluence is good, versus a pound of corn, so that's what poor people eat. The difference between the two is so profound, it takes 17 times more water to grow a pound of beef as it does to grow a pound of corn. Now, I won't deceive you or your viewers. All of agriculture is very water intensive, whether it's an almond or a pistachio or a pound of beef. But some things are much more so. And in a water constrained world, we need to be very mindful of the fact that, you know, we need to have a diet for a small planet. به عبارتی وقتی بعضی از مردم اندک غذای باقی مانده رو دور می‌ریزن دارن منابع زیاد آب رو هدر میدن درسته؟ I don't think people quite understand how water consumptive everything is. This sweater that I'm wearing, the shirt that I'm wearing, the glass I have all require enormous amounts of water. A glass of wine, a cup of tea, enormous amounts of water to produce what you you have in front of you. But that only calls for us to be more mindful on how we produce those things, how we use those things. I don't want to tell anyone, don't eat steak. I don't want to tell anybody, don't throw away half of your steak. People should do what they want to do. But you know what? We should stop subsidizing bad behaviors. We should stop giving subsidies, whether it's the farmers or to consumers, in the form of free or subsidized water. One of the brilliant things Israel does is they charge the actual full price of water. As a result, market forces go to work. People say, is this worth it? Is it not worth it? Mm -hmm. And you know what farmers say? Farmers say, if I flood the field, I have to pay this much for the water. But if I use technology with drip irrigation, I can save all that water. It's cheaper for me to use technology than for me to use all that water. You know what, while doing research for the book, so many people said to me, the problem about agriculture is that people say, that's not how my father did it. That's not how my grandfather did it. The Zionist revolution we spoke about earlier is challenge every assumption. So yes, your grandfather did it that way? Very nice. We're going to do it differently anyway. And that's what we need all over the world. We need an explosion of innovation. We need a revolution of the heart and the mind. And we need a revolution that will allow us to sustain this planet so that as we grow from 7 billion people to 8 to 9 to 10, maybe even to 11 billion people, they're now saying, we're going to be in a world where people are not going to be in humanitarian crisis and people have to be uprooted from their homes. Let's have a good, happy life for everybody. Let's get politics out of the way and let's come up with good, smart policies for everybody. One of the issues that for many of the Iranian leaders is the issue of the impact of Turkey on the water supply of Turkey. As you know, Turkey is in the project of GAP, which is a project of the large project in the Gulf شرقی آناتولی سطحهایی رو ایجاد کردند بر روی رودخانه های دجله و فرات و این سطحها بخش عمده از آبی رو که به سوریه و عراق میرفت رو عملا محدود کردند و حقابه عملا نمیرسید به عراق و سوریه و از طرف دیگه بخش هایی از طالاب های جنوب عراق به واسطه کمبود آبی که داره میرسه خوش شدن و سهمی از گرد و خاکی که به ریه های مردم جنوب غربی ایران وارد میشه به خاطر همین مسئله است این سوال وجود داره که با توجه به روابط و همکاری های ترکیه و اسرائیل آیا اسرائیل میتواند در این باب وارد گفتگو با ترکیه بشه که این پروژه رو به نحوی مدیریت بتونن بکنن که شرایط به بدی وضعیت فعلی نشه و به نظر شما چه راه حل هایی وجود داره که بشه این مشکل رو تا حدی حل کرد؟ You can uh, abuse nature for a while. Nature is very forgiving. But you can't forever abuse nature and don't think you're not going to pay a price. You can't dam up rivers and don't think that you're not going to have toxic dust storms. You can't do that and don't think that you're not going to lose your wetlands. So it's not just Turkey. This is all over the world, upriver countries are becoming greedy and taking the water that their downriver neighbors are accustomed to having. And I would argue that this is something far larger than just Turkey. This is something that requires a global conference and a global focus so that we have an understanding of what upriver and downriver countries have as obligations to each other. So I, I agree with you about the fact that this is a problem and that it's cost Syria and Iraq and now Iran actually 
grave kinds of problems, both socially, economically, and environmentally. I think you're right about it. Your, your question is exactly on point. But that said, I think that part of the reason why upriver countries need to take more water resources is because so many of them are so water inefficient. So many of them are so reckless with the use of water that they have that it leads to it leads to crazy policies where cotton is grown in a desert or alfalfa is grown with flood irrigation and you are wasting just enormous amounts of water that need not be wasted. So I, I agree with what you're talking about, but I think it's not limited just to Turkey. As to the question of whether Israel can influence Turkey, you know, one would hope so, but in the very near term, which is to say in the current political structure, it's less likely that Israel is going to be the prime mover and more likely that major world powers, in the same way that they got the climate conference together, that, that, that a river management system can be created by the major powers, by the United Nations, by the Secretary General and others to bring this to the fore. I think that that's the more likely path than to have a small country like Israel um, extending to this. Um, it, but. But the great opportunity is, is that everybody could learn something from the Israeli experience. And I wanted to say one last word. Israel is a very special country. It's a wonderful country. And for the people watching this in Iran, I, I, I dream of the day when every one of you who desires to do so can come to Israel and with your own eyes see and meet Israeli people, some of whom are very nice and you will like, some of whom are obnoxious who you won't like, just like people everywhere. But. What I want to say is that every country everywhere in the world has something to learn from Israel about water, but at the same time, Israel has done great things in water, but they've done nothing that everybody can't do also. Countries that are large, countries that are wealthy, countries that are poor, everybody can do something to affect and change and improve their water future. Certainly, Iran can do that. Certainly, Iran can spend less money for weapons and military and other programs that we don't want to talk about necessarily and spend more money for a better water future for your country. And that is something that whether you do it in partnership with Israel or from afar just watching with admiration or otherwise what Israel has done, this is something that every Iranian should aspire to and ask their government to be doing. Love Israel, don't love Israel, do it holding your nose or don't or do it holding your hand out in love and handshake, but one way or another, please do it.